right? Mordechai, it's good now, right? Oh. No. What? Yes. yes. It's good. It's good. It's good now. Okay, here we go. Okay. Oh. Okay, good. Ruchim Abayim, welcome everyone to the Parsha Shia on Parsha's B'Shalach. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, make mention that today's Parsha Shia and the entire Shabbos Shira that we're going to do this week is being sponsored by the Lady Yitzchak Heimowitz, uh, who davens with us in the morning, in memory of his mother, Italeya Bas Reb Tzvi Hersh, whose yard site is actually Shabbos. So we uh, wish uh, Reb Levi Yitzchak that the uh, of his mother have an aliyah and a dischus that he's sponsoring this year and dedicated in her memory. All the learning we do should be... Rabbi, in- excuse me, Rabbi. Yeah. Yes? Is everybody muted? Because I see that somebody's... All right, we'll take a look if everybody's muted again. We'll try to do it. Okay. Yeah. Once so again, please, uh, it could be some people just joined it, just joined and they weren't muted, muted. Now they're no, muted. No, Rabbi, no. No, this person has been on uh, before, uh, before you even started. All right, so I'm not going to allow anyone to unmute. That's all. All right, everyone is now muted. You still hear that person? No? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and allow to unmute, but we're going to mute everybody. Okay. So everybody's allowed to unmute at the right time, but not at this moment. Sorry it takes so long to get this thing started. Okay, let's get back to this. All right, so we are we are at the beginning of Parshas B'Shalach. And uh, we have to pay attention at the very beginning to the very first words in the Parsha. The, the first words of Ayyehi B'Shalach Paro Esa'am. And it, and it was, and it was when Paro sent out the nation. Now the Gemara Megillah on Daf Yud makes a statement about the word Vayahi, a very, very strange statement, but it bears out. Whenever you have the word Vayahi, it's an it's a indication that there's going to be some trouble. The word Vayahi always means that there is a difficulty coming. Example, Vayehi bimei Achashverosh. It was in the days of Achashverosh. Sure enough, not long after, there was tremendous difficulty for the Jewish people. That's why the Gemara in Megillah brings that particular statement down. So the word Vayehi implies that there's some trouble at the very beginning. The question, of course, is when, when, uh, when Paro sends out the Jewish people, this would seem to be no trouble at all. On the contrary, this is like the greatest gift the Jewish people have had. He's sending the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim. Hashem has convinced him that the Jewish people have to get out, and he, he sends them out. The Bishalach Paro is a um. Paro sends out the people. What's the trouble? Reb Tzodek HaKohen, the famous Reb Tzodek HaKohen from Lublin, the author of the Tzidkas HaTzadik, he, he makes an unbelievable observation. Reb Tzodek says like this, it's not only Paro that saw all the miracles, all the Nisim, all the plagues. It wasn't only him. All the Jewish people saw the Nisim and saw the plagues. But still, despite the fact that they saw all the Nisim, they saw all the miracles, they saw that the Jewish people were left untouched. They saw the blood, the frogs, the kinim, the all of them, the tzachadash ba'achav, they saw everything, right? And they should have gone on their own at this point. The Pasuk is telling us there's a little bit of a little bit Musa in here. And that little Musa says what Tzadik Agoin is, even after all this time, 
You know what it took to get the Jews out of Egypt? The Shalach Paro is um. Paro had to send out, get out of here already. I can't stand having you around here. Please leave. Why didn't we just pick ourselves up and go on our own? Oy, says Reb Tzodik. It's like you can take the Jew out of Golos, but what you really got to do is take the Golos out of the Jew. We have to be able to say to ourselves, I am not in Golos. I do not have to be in exile. I can be free. And of course, when we say I can be free, it doesn't mean like we once explained, free of any responsibility. It means I can be free to make my own choices. I don't have to have a slave mentality. You know, in the Civil War, when the slaves in America were freed, and so many of them couldn't make it, and they went back to their masters, and they went back because they needed to be under the protection of their master because they had a slave mentality and how dangerous that is and how difficult that is. Allah has come of a comma, the Jewish people. And by the way, it should be noted that one of the great spiritual songs that the slaves in the South used to sing was, go down Moses, you know? It was let my people go because that's really what it's all about. It's gotta be that we have to be willing to be free. We have to stand up and say, I'm not enslaved. I don't have to wait for Pyro to send us out. I don't have to wait for events of history to push me out of the Gullus that I'm in. I have to make my own decision to get out of Gullus. And this is so timely because the Jewish people in America, we are living in perhaps what is absolutely to be considered the very best Gullus the Jews have ever been in. Rav Moshe Zatzal himself, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zatzal Levrocha, in his Chuvis writes that the Gullus in America is a Gullus of a Malchus Shel Chesed. It's a kingdom of kindness, and it is. It's very kind to the Jews, and it's always been kind to the Jews. But something about being in the Golis has to get out of our systems. And we have to be willing to recognize that. And so Reb Tzadik HaKohen, at the very beginning of the Prasha says, the Vayehi, which the Gemara says is a sign of Tsaris, it's only because Mishalach Paro es um. It's because Paro sent out the people. And the people themselves were reluctant. And they didn't want to go on their own. And they should have. And they should have gone on their own. OK. The Tzukim continue, and they tell us that, you know, Hashem took the Jewish people out of Egypt towards the desert, towards the Yamsuf. For those who know the map of Eretz Israel, and we, didn't have, we don't have a map in front of us, but there are plenty of maps you can take a look at. Going from Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula, has the Reed Sea on two sides. And at the very top, it is connected to the land of Egypt. In fact, at the top of the Sinai Peninsula is where the Suez Canal is, because it's the narrowest part of the Sinai Peninsula and the Reed Sea and the Mediterranean reach through that little area which the Suez Canal is ultimately in. Anyway, the Suez Canal, of course, is right by the lands of Gaza and the Philistines. So the Pusik says later on that Hashem didn't want us to go through that way. But I'd like to take a look at the Pusik where it says over here, Vachamushim Olu B'nei Yisrael Eretz Mitzrayim. Now, if you'll take a look at the English translation, it says here that now the Israelites went up armed out of the land of Egypt. Now, what does Vachamushim literally mean? The word chamushim, what does the word chamushim literally mean? Chamushim means one-fifth. One-fifth of the Jewish people. Chamu, uh, uh, ech, ech, five books of Moses. Chamushim means only one-fifth went out of the land of Egypt. Rashi quotes the famous Medrash that there were four-fifths of the Jewish people 
that did not leave Egypt. They died in Egypt. They didn't want to leave Egypt. Can you imagine that? They didn't want to leave. They were so comfortable, so used to the exile, so used to the gullus. It's a known factor. Who's this Moses is leading us out of the land? You know? Well, what was, he's going to the desert. You have any plan? Let me know the plan. Uh, Moshe, what's the plan of action here? How are we going to get 3 million people? And it wasn't 3, because 3 million was only one-fifth. There were 15 million, right? It was only one-fifth went out. 15 million. Where are you going to put us? How do we get anywhere? How are we going to cross the desert? What about food? How are we going to last? Who's going to feed us? What's going to happen? What's going to happen if we're attacked? What are we going to live on? We, have, we don't have huts. We don't have what to do. We have nothing. I, we're not going. You, 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 you're dreaming. You're dreaming. This is all dream. It's, it's, it's a cholum. We're not following you. This is this man's Meshuga. We're not going to go. And they didn't want to go. So they didn't. They stayed in Egypt. They died in Egypt. And only one fifth left. I, I have a harusa that I learned with who studied under Rabbi Yosheb Ber Salavechik, Rabbi Chaim Jach, that he should live me well. He said to me that he heard from Rabbi Yosheb Ber Zatzal that Rabbi Yosheb Ber said this pasuk, one fifth has remained true throughout almost all of Jewish history, that in every period of Jewish history, there's been a 20% of the Jews who have been loyal to the Torah, while there's always been a large percentage that were looking to go against the Torah and manufactured all kinds of logics and atheisms and thisism and thatism and communism and whatever it is. And it was always one-fifth that remained loyal to the Torah. And so the Pesach says, Vachamushim went out. And Vachamushim means one-fifth. But notice that the English translate Vachamushim as armed. I'd like to show you a Rashi on this Pesach. Here's the Rashi. Look at this Rashi. Okay, you see it? Here's the Rashi. Vachamushim. What does Rashi say? Ein chamushim elo mizuyanim. What does chamushim mean? Chamushim means armed. The word chamushim means armed. Armed to the teeth. The Jewish people left Egypt armed. Now, you have to ask yourself, and you have to say, all right, Rashi's quoting the Medrash, and he, and he says that the Jewish people, when they left Egypt, they left the Jewish people left armed. And as the Targum says, they were armed. What were they armed with? What did they arm themselves with? What, where, did, where did 3 million people, all of a sudden, 600,000 men between the age of 21 and 60, where, where did they get arms from? Where, where did they get swords bows and arrows and, and, and lances and, 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 and all kinds of, of weapons. Where did they get it? And how could they possibly all be armed? It doesn't seem to make sense when it says that they left Egypt armed. So you should know that the, the, the meaning of the word armed has many, many meanings. I want to show you something that comes up in Parshas Vayechi. Here's a, here's a Here's a statement. Here's a statement that was made way back in Pasha's Vayechi, where it says, where it says uh, that right before Yaakov blesses his children, he's got Yosef there, and he says to Yosef, "Va'ani nosati shechem achad al achecha," and I am giving to you the portion of the land known as Shechem. One more portion than all your other brothers, Asher lo kachti miyado amori, which I took from the hand of the Amorites, v'charbi uv'kashti, with my sword and with my bow. With my sword and with my bow. Yaakov took Shechem from the Amorites with his sword and with his bow. We don't find anywhere that Yaakov went 
to war. His children, yes. Shimon and Levi went into Shechem, and after Dina was abused by the prince of the town, they wiped out all the males. And Shechem became a Jewish town. And by the way, I've mentioned this once before, but I'm going to mention it again. How many of us know the Arabic name of Shechem? We still call it Shechem today. We still call it the city of Shechem. And Yosef, by the way, is buried in Shechem. Like it says that in this week's Hedger, Moshe took Atzmos Yosef Emo and he buried it later on, not him, but the Jewish people took it and buried it in the city of Shechem, which was given to Yosef by Yaakov. Look at the prophecies rolling over one into the other. And the prophecy came true that Yosef was given Shechem and that's in his property. That's the land of Ephraim, the son of Yosef. It's in the hills of Ephraim. That's where Shechem is. But do you know what the Arabs still call Shechem? Does anyone, unmute yourself if you know what they call Shechem. Tell us, what is the name of Shechem in Arabic language? What do they call that city? Anybody know? All right, I'll tell you. When you hear it, you'll know it right away. Nablus. They call Shechem Nablus. What does that mean? The word Nablus comes from the word Naval. Naval is a disgusting thing, a maneuver. Because what Shechem did to Dina, as the Pasuk says, Ki Nevala Asa Bebas Yisrael Vechein Lo Yeyaseh. They did a disgusting thing to our sister, and that can't stand. And so they wiped out the town. But guess what? These people are very happy calling it Nablus. They like that name. Ha <laughs> we got those Jews. We beat up on an innocent little girl. Yeah? That's, that's, that's Shechem. Anyway, let's get back to our issue. It says that I took Shechem Bechar Biyuvakashti with my sword and with my bow. What does that mean? Where did Yaakov take this with his sword and with his bow? Watch this. I'm showing you now the Unklus translation. Look at the Targum translation. I am going to give to you, this is the translation of that Pasuk, I'm going to give you Shechem, one more portion over your brothers, that I took out of the hands of the Amorites. Now look at the next two words. Becharbi becomes bitslosi with my prayer. And and Bikashti with my bow, Ubiba Usi, and with my supplication. So Tsolosi means my prayer, and Bausi means my supplication. When the Targum translates the word Bekharbi Uvakashti that we just had over here, Bekharbi Uvakashti, he's translating those two words to mean my sword means my prayer and my bow means my supplication. Let's go back to our Pasuk. Our Pasuk says, Achamushim. the Jewish people went out armed. Armed is nothing more than that they had weapons, right? So it says here, that's, that's a, we want a different Pasuk. We'll get back to this in a minute. So it, it says here that the Jewish people left armed, right? Claudius Yisrael left armed. Uh, armed, here we go. They left armed. What did they take with them? They took prayer and supplication. Now, let me tell you the difference between them. We have to know the difference between prayer and supplication. Watch this. There is an unbelievable explanation of what they took with them. We said that they took with them charbi. Again, I both say, what's charbi? Cherev means what? My sword, right? That's my prayer. My sword is my prayer. And what's Bikashti, my bow? My bow is my supplication. As 
we translated, right? Over here, as we translated, Bitslosi, Ube Bausi, Bitslosi means my prayer, and Bausi means my supplication. Let me explain the difference. When someone has a prayer, when someone comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we give a prayer, it's like a sword. A sword doesn't need a tremendous amount of strength to do damage. It's so sharp that once you push that sword at the intended target, it will pierce the target because its blade is as sharp as a razor and it's instantaneous because they used to sharpen it very, very well. And a sword is close. You're close to Hashem when you when it says my sword is my weapon, my prayer, it means I'm putting my sword right up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and I'm saying to him, please answer my prayer. But Usi, my supplication, my inner request is like a bow and arrow. And with a bow and arrow, it doesn't work unless you put in koach, unless you put in a lot of strength. And in fact, the more strength you put in, the far there the arrow goes. So that a bow, you pull back. And the farther you pull back on the bow, the further the arrow is going to be shot. So when a Jew comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu with supplication, when a Jew comes to Hashem with prayer, we have to know what to do. We can't just stand there and mouth the words. We can't just stand there and say, Empty words, we've got to pull back. We have to reach deep into our neshama and pull back with all our koach so that we send that arrow to its intended target. And that's what it means that the Jewish people left Egypt armed. They left armed with the teachings of the Jewish people that the power of the Jews is in their sword, in their prayer, and in the supplication, in their bow and arrow, and that's the weapons of the Jewish people. Mizuyanim, they are clearly armed, and that's the weapons of the Jewish people. So now, let's take a look at this one more time. There's a little bit more to this, a little more. Some of you might have heard this before, I don't know. You might know about this. What does Mizuyanim mean? Mizuyanim means armed, right? How do we call weapons in Hebrew? What's the Hebrew word for weapon? Clay Zion. Clay Zion. Weapons of Zion. Zion means weapons. Why does Zion mean weapons? Rabosai, take a look at a letter Zion. What's it shaped like? The letter Zion, if you look inside the scripture of the Torah, you will see that the letter Zion looks like a sword. It looks like a sword. It's got a handle and a sharp point on the bottom. That's the way a letter Zion is shaped in the scripture of the Torah. Because Zion means a sword. Rabosai, do you know that there are seven letters in the Torah, out of the 22 letters of the Hebrew Alephase, there are seven letters that on top of those seven letters are crowns. Do you know what those seven letters are? Every single one of them that has a Zion in it. All right? Every letter that has a Zion in it has a crown on top of it. What are those letters? Shat, Nez, Gatz, Shin, Ayin, Tes, Nun, Zion, Gimel, Tzadik. Take a look at each one of these letters in a Sefer Torah. Look at the Shin. One of the arms of the Shin is Mamash a Zion. Mama Shazayin. Ayin. The leg of the Ayin is a Zion. 
It's not just a strict stroke. It's an actual Zion. Tess, one of the arms of the Tess is an actual Zion. A nun, the arm of the nun is an actual Zion. And a Zion, of course, is a Zion. A Gimel, the body of the Gimel standing up is a Zion. And Sadi, the body of the Sadi is a Zion. All the letters in the Torah that have a Zion in them have three crowns on top. Next time you get an Aliyah in the Sefer Torah, take a look at it. You'll see that all of those seven letters have crowns on their top because they are the weapons of the Jewish people. The letters of the Torah are the weapons of the Jewish people. That's why the study of Torah protects the Jewish people. That's why prayer protects the Jewish people. And that's why when the Jews left Egypt, they left Egypt Nizuyanim with the Zayan, with all the weapons of the Torah, with the weapons of prayer, the weapons of Becharbi, Uvakashti, Bitslosi, U Biba Usi. So the Jewish people leave Egypt and they're taking with them the weapons that their parents had taught them, the weapons of Bikharbi, U Bikashti. Okay. Let's go now a little further. Back to our back to our Let me just move, let me move this a bit. Uh, over here, let me try this one over here. Okay, good. In the beginning of the Shalach. And of course, it says that Moshe took the Atzmos Yosef with him, as we uh, learned. By the way, I, I do discuss, I do discuss that uh, in the Parsha video uh, in this week's Parsha. So if you'll take a look at it, you'll see uh, what's going on with that particular statement. Okay. So Paro lets them go, he runs after them, you know. And Moshe says to the people, don't be afraid. Stand and you will see the saving power of Hashem, which he will do for you today, because the way you see Mitzrayim today, you will never see Egypt again like this. It's amazing, that I was saying. Let's go through history. Isn't it amazing? Egypt was the most powerful nation on earth. They started up with the Jews. They never became a world power again. Never, ever, ever. They're a backwards. They're no match. They're a third world country. It doesn't come anywhere near what Egypt was. Rome, Greece, Spain, Phoenicia, Iraq, Iran, Persia, they're all nothing. The Jews are still here. Amazing. Okay. Moshe tells them, Hashem yilachem lachem. This passage is so important. Hashem will fight for you. Ba'atem tacharishun. And you are to be silent. We should know that there is a movement which was started many years ago called the Taharishan movement. And the, Tach the Taharishan movement is a movement that was put together by a man in the town of Elizabeth, New Jersey, a man named Safran who wanted to get across the idea that when people come to shul, they should not talk in shul. So he called it the Taharishan movement. And it, it, it achieved some widespread help yeah. at some point, but we can use more. I want to tell you what Rabbi Anderson Ivashitz, the great Teferis Yehonasan, says about this particular person. An unbelievable thing. Hashem yilachem lachem. Hashem is going to fight for you. The atem, but the one thing that you must do is tacharishun. You must be silent. By the way, the word tacharishun, Rav Shamshim Hirsch, 
in his etymological brilliance, asks, what is the origin of the word tacharishan? So we know that a cheresh, someone who can't hear, is a cheresh. But what's the origin of the word cheresh? The origin of the word cheresh is lacharosh. Lacharosh means to plow. When you plow in the earth, you uncover the, the gifts that the earth has hidden within it. When a person hears, they're able to uncover the gift of speech. They're able to delve into what the words mean and how it relates to their lives. One of the greatest gifts that we have is our gift to be able to hear. And hearing doesn't only mean physical hearing. You know what people say, do you hear me? Oh yes, I hear you. It means much more than just hear. Shema Yisrael. Does it just mean hear? Or does it mean plow into those words? What do they mean? So here, there's a word. Here it says, Hashem Yilachem Lachem. Hashem will fight for you. Ba'atem Tacharishun. Says Rabbi Yonah sent Ibishitz. No matter what the Gullus has done to the Jewish people, they can have an excuse for just about everything. In fact, any other nation who had ever gone through one smidgen of what the Jewish people have been gone through, being sent away from place to place and country to country and exile to exile, you know, no other nation exists when it's taken over by another nation. You know, the, the, the Syrian Greeks were taken over by another nation. You don't see any of these people anymore. They're not walking the streets. The culture is gone. The only people that continue to exist are the Jewish people. Every nation disappears. So any, because, because exile and trouble destroys a culture. <clears throat> so, so we can be forgiven for all errors that the Jewish people do because every nation is, is, is subject to being destroyed when they're attacked on a regular basis over and over and over again. But the Jewish people have an excuse for everything, says Rabbi Anderson Rabbi Anderson says, except one thing, except one thing. When it comes to davening, when it comes to davening and people talk, said Rabbi Anderson Ibershitz, in shul, what's going on over here? What is happening here? Is HaKadosh Baruch Hu there? Is that the Makom of the Migdash Ma'at? Is that the place where Hashem is? Well then, the only thing we should be doing is communicating with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Nothing else. There shouldn't be any more than just that speech between us and God, between us and our Kodesh Baruch Hu, and that's what the post is saying. Hashem yilochem lochem. You want God to fight for you? A hundred percent. Hashem is going to fight for you, the Jewish people. But one thing you must know, the atem, you, tacharishun, when it comes to davening, don't speak. Be absolutely silent. Just say words of prayer. That's all. Nothing more. Now, there are, there, there are famous uh, stories about different uh, approaches to how we should do, what we should do in order to increase the kavana and the silence in the shul. But there was, uh, there, there was this uh, rabbi and priest that were having a discussion. And the priest was saying to the rabbi, you know, uh, there are a lot of things about you Jews that I, 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 I just don't get. I just don't get it whatsoever. And the rabbi says, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, I walk into your places of study and uh, there, there's, there's books all over the places. 
everything is lying around, nothing is in its place, everything is, you know, the place is like, you know, to use the Hebrew word hefker, you know, as far from here, as far from there, things all over the place, you know, and you have cups of, 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 of seltzer and water in order to drink from, and maybe there's a little bit of a kiddish going on over there. And so he said, but you know, in our, in our churches, you come in and it's pristine. There's, there's, there's not a drop of paper on the floor and the, all the prayer books are in their, in, in their place and so on. And everybody, you know, it's different. So he says, yeah, what else don't you like? He says, I'll tell you another thing. When you walk into your place, everybody's screaming their heads off. Everybody's yelling at the top of their lungs, Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish. They're yelling, oh, man, yeah, he's my robber. You come to our churches, you can hear a pin drop. There's not a sound. We pray silently, softly. It's so beautiful. And about your funerals, I've got to tell you, I've never seen so much wailing and crying. You know, our funerals are so respectful. Everybody stands at attention. You know, that, that's it, Rabbi. I, I just don't like those three things about the Jewish people. So the Rabbi says, you know, you're 100% correct. You're really correct. But you know, there's a reason behind this. After all, our God's a very old God. And he didn't have a mother to clean up after him. Consequently, you know, the prayer books are all over the place. We can't help it. That's the way it is. And uh, when it comes to all the screaming and wailing, that's because, you know, it, it, our God is uh, 5,000 something years old. And we really have to get the prayers to go directly all the way up to heaven. So it's, it's a little difficult. And maybe, maybe after all these years, you know, maybe he doesn't hear as well because, you know, hero Israel, you know. And in terms of funerals, you're 100% correct. I'd rather go to 10 of yours than one of ours, you know. So, so people, people uh, try to make fun about 10 Tacharish and you should be silent. But the fact is, the silence should be a silence where we don't speak out. All we do is pray and not talk about. Okay. Now, I have a feeling that I discussed this Pasuk once before at a shear. I don't it couldn't have been last year, B'Shalach, because we didn't have the shear last year on B'Shalach. But if any of you remember this fine, if you don't, I want to share with you something that is unbelievable. This particular pasuk has been explained to me many years ago by a very wonderful gentleman named Mordechai Eisner. Any of you might have known him, he lived in Borough Park on 55th and 15th. A wonderful, wonderful person, and we used to learn together. And one day on the way home from Shul, he said to me, I must tell you something that I heard from my Rebbe in Auschwitz. I was a young boy, and we had about, I don't know, 10 or 12 of the boys in our class, and our Rebbe was also with us in Auschwitz. And whenever the Rebbe could, he would gather us together, even under the penalty of death. But he gathered us together and he would teach us Torah. And this was one of the last, if not the last thing that he taught us. And he asked us to please remember it and tell it over and see to it that it's told over in his name. The Rebbe's name was a Baruch Man. And this is what he said about this Pesach. Now, if you have a pen and paper, you might want to write some things down here. But I'm going to show you a gematria that if you like gematria at all, this one's going to blow your mind. All right, you ready? Here we go. Hashem speaks to Moshe. And he says to Moshe, You, Moshe, are to lift up your staff. Unitei Yodcha, and stretch out your arm, al hayam, on the sea, uvka ehu, and split it. This is the pasuk in which Hashem is commanding Moshe to split the Red Sea. Okay, you got it. And he asked the following question of the boys in Auschwitz that Rabbi Mordechai Eisner, Zechariah Levracha, told me. And this is what he said: I want you to do the translation of this pasuk in numbers. And it goes like this. The Ata and you, Horeim, lift up Matcha. Lift up Matcha. Take the word Matcha and lift it up. Let's do that. 
let's lift up the word matcha. If I take a if I take a mem, the first letter, and I lift it up one letter, what does it become? You can unmute if you want to answer. The mem becomes a nun. Nun. A nun. All right. Then let's let's lift up the tes. The tes becomes a yud. Yud. Let's lift up the chaf. The chaf becomes a lamed. Let's add those three together. All right. Yeah. A mem becomes a nun. That's fifty. The test becomes a yud, that's 10, that's 60 now, 50. 10 and 50. And chaf becomes a lamed, which is 30, 60 and 30 90. is 90. 90. Now, I, I want to tell you that before he did this, he asked the boys to keep in mind the following. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a number of different names. We know that. Which names did Hashem use to split the Yamsuf? Because there are many names. Elohim, Aleph Dalad Nun Yud, Shin Dalad Yud Shakai, right? Aleph Yud Yud, Yud Yud. Vavke. There are many names. Which names did he use to split the Yamsa? So the boys didn't know. So he said, I'll tell you which names. I'll tell you which names he used. He used the Aleph Dalad Nun Yud name. And the Yud K Vav K name. He used, used those two names. And I'll prove it to you. What's the gematria of Aleph Dalid Nun Yud? So an Aleph is one, a Dalid is four, a five. Nun is 50, and a Yud is, is 10. 65. Six, right. right? That's 65. Add right. that to the name Yud K Vav K which is a total 26. of 26. 65 and 26? 91. 91. Okay, good. Let's get back to us. Hashem tells Moshe, lift up matcha, lift up your stair. Unite and stretch down or out yotcha. Lower yotcha. Stretch it out. Go down yotcha. Take the word yotcha and go down one letter each of these three letters. So what do we go down? The Yud becomes a Tess. The Dalit go down one becomes a Gimel. Yeah. The Chaf go down one becomes a Yud. Yud. S and Gimel is 12 and Yud is 10 is 22. 22. Right. We take the 22, we add it to the 65. It gives us a total of uh, not, not 65. Uh, no, 91. 90. We take the 22, we add it to the 90. 91. No, no, 91, 90, no? 90, 90. Matcha, no. matcha was 90. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, matcha became nun, yud, lamed. That was 90, right? 90. right? We, take the, we take the tes, gimel, and yud, which is a total of 22. We add the 22 to the 90. We have a total of 112. 112. Then it says, al hayom. You go on top of the word yam, over the yud and over the mem. So let's go over the yud. Over the yud is what? A chaf. chaf. And over the mem is a nun. nun. Chaf and nun is 70, right? Yep. Right? We add the 70 yep. to the 112. What do we got? 182. 182. Next word. And split it. What happens when you split 182? 91. 91. Okay. That's the two names that our Kaddish Baruch Hu used to split the Yamsuf. Based on the translation of this particular person. Based on the translation of this person. Parshas B'Shalach has so many elements in it that we need to consider the, the Shira. I just want to mention that the beginning of the Shira, of course, is Oz Yashir Moshe. We're all familiar with that. And if you'll take a look at the first word, Oz Yashir Moshe, then Moshe and the Bnei Yisrael will sing. They will sing. It doesn't say they sang. It says they 
will sing. You should know that in the Gemara, this is in the Medrash, this is mentioned as a proof of Trias HaMesim in the Torah. This is one of the proofs because Moshe didn't just sing then, but he is going to sing again. And the Jewish people are going to sing again. We have to be aware that despite all the difficulties we go through, no matter how many trials and tribulations the Jewish people as individuals and as a people go through, we have this unbelievable optimistic prophecy as Yashir Moshe of Israel. In the future, Moshe and the Jewish people are going to sing. We're going to sing tremendous songs and we're going to say, this is my God and I will glorify him. And that is something that is of a tremendous source of calmness when facing the future of our lives. Because no matter what, we know that this Trias HaMesim, and that it doesn't mean only physical resurrection. Trias HaMesim means many, many things. You get up in the morning, that's a form of Trias HaMesim. Every year your body changes cells, that's a form of Trias HaMesim. Someone was sick and they get out of a COVID sick bed, that's a Trias HaMesim. Someone was, was depressed and didn't want to face life. And then they get healed. That's a Trias HaMesim. And if somebody went OTD off the derech and then comes back as we all do, that's a Trias HaMesim. And when a baby is born and given a name of a deceased parent or grandparent, that's Trias HaMesim. So there are many, many ways in which Trias HaMesim takes place. But here in our Sedra is one of the psukim that give us an insight into the fact of Trias HaMesim. All right, we, we were just about one out of time. Are there any questions? You can unmute yourself at this point. Okay, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to... Uh, to are, there any questions, are there any questions, Mark? Are there any questions, Rabosan? Any comments? Okay. So I want to wish everyone... Yeah? Mordechai is there. How are you, Mordechai? Everybody, we all I'm doing, you. I'm doing, I'm doing really good. Baruch Hashem, you sound very, very super awesome, super awesome. Yeah. Baruch really Hashem. good. I'm so happy. To bless you only with all good things, Amen. and everybody Amen. else Amen. along with you. We should have Amen. Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Okay, Rabbi Osai, Shabbat Shalom and Mubarak. Have a wonderful day. A wonderful era of Shabbos tomorrow and a wonderful... Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, thank you, Rabbi. You're the best. Thank you, we will, we will speak to you in Yetz Hashem next week. Yetz Hashem. Yes, sir. Once Have a again, good today, Shabbos. Yes, once again, today's shear was sponsored by Reb Levi Yitzchak Heimowitz in memory of his mother, Italeya Bas. Who is that? He is in our shul. He, was, he stands uh, in the same row as Rabbi Kiva. He stands in Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva's row to, towards the uh, wall. Yeah. Okay. In the front? In the yeah, front? He's not, he's oh, he's yeah. a wonderful man. Yes. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. Yes. We only have wonderful people. In <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Yeah, could we go to one for Rabbi? Yeah. yeah Baruch Hashem. That's right. Hey, have a wonderful Shabbos, everybody. Hey, good Shabbos, everybody. Good Shabbos, everybody. Good Shabbos. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you.